Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope you hear me okay. Um, so the impact of climate transition policies on Belgian firms. What can we learn from a survey? And I'll promise to get to that answer very soon. Uh, but first, I'd like to thank the organizers for including us in this unique setup. Uh, the colloquium is, is um, quite different from other papers I worked on. Um, so in academia, deadlines are often imaginary. Uh, you can push them. But here you have one year to really deliver something concrete. And it was very uh, refreshing, to say the least. Uh, it was fun. Uh, so I'd like to thank the entire generation of 2024. Um, it was very nice during the intermittent meetings to get feedback. Uh, and a special thanks to Antoine, who uh, agreed to be our discussant. So he's a real expert in the field. Um, in fact, he's the most cited uh, author uh, in our paper. So believe him when he says something, uh, especially if it's praise, but also if it's critique. Uh, and we also got a lot of help from experts uh, in the field, in, in the bank. Uh, a lot of people are here today. Uh, so this is not our work alone. But at the same time, you know that uh, what I'm going to say does not necessarily reflect the views of the bank. Um, so the usual disclaimers apply. And of course, the, the jokes, the bad jokes that I'm going to tell, uh, those are mine alone. Uh, so they don't necessarily reflect the, the humor of my co-authors. Uh, so voilà. Before we start, I'm going to try to keep things light, uh, because it's Friday afternoon, it's almost weekend. Um, so before we start, um, a small thought exercise. Um, I'm going to ask you to write down, or keep in your head, the expectation, um, or your expectation, for the carbon price in the EU ETS by 2030. So the price of emission allowances, so the cost of uh, per ton of CO2 produced. So keep that in mind, keep that aside. Um, can be anything. And to get our baselines correct or aligned, um, when we launched the survey, it was about at 65 euros per ton CO2. So take your time, and then we'll start. So um, let's start with a familiar site. So we may have walked past this mural before. Uh, it's in the heart of the European district. Um, so on the left, we see uh, students protesting. Um, so people raising their voices, uh, calling for urgent action, uh, to reduce carbon emissions and to protect our planet. And on the right, we see businesses, in this case farmers, uh, who are protesting in those very same streets, uh, but for another reason. So they're protesting um, or they're raising concerns that the policies being adopted are unfair, burdensome, um, and they, they are afraid about their, their livelihoods. So two valid concerns, um, and they highlight the challenges that, that Europe must face, um, and they illustrate the frictions of reconciling the environmental policy with the economic realities of certain sectors. Uh, sorry, I, uh, my, my glasses are a bit broken. I have a, a young kid of nine months, and uh, well, yeah, okay, you know what happened. Um, so, our paper in a nutshell. So, um, our objective is to analyze or to explore how Belgian firms are preparing and responding to uh, current and planned uh, climate policies. So, as they approach this 2030 milestone within the European Green Deal. So let's clarify some things from the start. Uh, we're not going to ask whether the climate transition is bad for firms. That's a very difficult question, and there's no easy answer. Uh, but we're going to ask another question. Uh, these protests we're seeing um, aren't just about resistance. They're concerns about what the future might hold, um, and they're a response to uncertainty. So they're asking what's going to happen, uh, how will this affect us? So they're rooted in expectations, these protests. Uh, sometimes diverse, sometimes contradictory, um, but it's those expectations that will shape how uh, firms or individual firms will react to policies. That's what we're going to try to capture. So again, a very difficult question, um, and the available data to answer this question is, is, well, it's not there. It's very scarce, especially in the Bel Belgian context. Uh, and existing academic research relies heavily on, on past data, uh, the data that is available, so it reflects the past. Um, and these studies can provide some insight, but they, they fall short in predicting what might happen if there is a future tightening of climate policies. Uh, because we're always told by those darn policymakers that we must uh, accelerate our pace to reduce emissions. So that's where, where uh, targeted business surveys come in. Uh, so the National Bank is very experienced in doing those. Um, so during the pandemic, we had uh, the ERMG uh, group, which uh, proved vital during, well, during COVID. And then now, once again, these targeted business surveys can explore another topic, um, the climate transition, and that's our hope. 
So again, we relied on the same network, and it works, okay. So we relied on the same network uh, of employer federations um, who might be here today, so thank you guys. Um, and we made this survey using internal banking tools and then we used their network to, to really share it. So they used their uh, mailing list or LinkedIn advertising. Uh, and this allowed us to really target those executive level employees with a broad strategic view about the company. Okay, so uh, our job is not to speculate. We don't want to just write opinions uh, based on what we know. We really want to uh, gather data on what firms expect or what they perceive or what obstacles are uh, in the run up to 2030. So, uh, first joke. I thought it was funny, but uh, some people might not think it's funny. Um, but what did we find out? Uh, so as, as Pierre, our governor, mentioned yesterday, the climate transition is largely seen as a negative supply shock. Um, and, well, uh, we, we expect, uh, which is very typical for regulatory transitions, so higher costs, uh, squeezed margins, lower activity. And that's what firms also perceive uh, if they think about the future. Uh, and we also see that a significant portion of production capacity might shift outside of the EU. And we see that especially for manufacturing firms. Um, and which is something which is very surprising or may not be surprising, okay? Um, it's that uh, many firms express widespread skepticism about the feasibility of reaching those Fit for 55 goals by 2030. Uh, also ETS firms. Um, and firms identify the, the usual suspects when they talk about obstacles. Uh, for their investments, so, so costs, profitability, uh, unclear policy guidance, and administrative burdens. So, um, so let's dive into our sample. Um, and to be completely honest, I, I brought too many graphs and tables, so we're not going to be able to cover everything, but if you're interested or somehow curious, uh, the paper's online, um, and let us know or talk to us. Um, voilà. So, overview of our sample. Uh, we went as broad as possible, so we encouraged all firms of all sizes, all sectors to participate because every company might uh, contribute to uh, the impact of the climate transition or how, how it might impact our economy. Um, so we focused on ETS, so there are a lot of services firms, a lot of manufacturing firms, and we also focused on ETS because that's an important part, uh, an important policy instrument uh, in the transition. Uh, we have about 10% of our uh, sample within ETS, which is, which is nice. Okay, um, first results, and that's immediately a, a big one, I think. So uh, we asked them to, to uh, calculate or, or give a prediction uh, of the, or give an estimate, sorry, of the current carbon price, and most firms didn't know. So they, they just said, I think about 80% or something, they didn't know uh, what current carbon price might be, and, and we allowed them to be very crude about it. So uh, there was a big margin that you could select, so they had to tick off boxes. Uh, but of course, ETS firms do know. That's, that's the, first, the first graph. Um, and we also asked them whether they believe in Fit for 55, and then you see also these ETS firms don't believe in it, um, which is a bit problematic. Um, but it is what it is. That's what we observe. But at the same time, we see that it's very strategically important to them, uh, the climate transition, um, across all firms. Okay, um, we also asked them what companies, what obstacles do the companies face when they uh, make climate-related decisions. Uh, and the top three, it's costly uh, or unprofitable, no clear policies, administrative burdens. So these are very common when we talk about transitions. Um, and when we ask what factors are expected to influence their climate-related investments, well, energy prices pops up. Uh, and that is also climate policies. And then you see, unsurprisingly, well, carbon prices matter more to ETS firms than non-ETS firms. Okay. Um, and when we look at those energy prices, well, this is a common sentiment uh, among Belgian firms. We see that they expect um, that things are unfair. Well, Belgian energy prices are much higher than in other countries or the rest of the world, um, which is problematic if it's uh, an important indicator to make decisions. Okay, so that was a warm-up. So we asked them about the past impact on their financial and operational uh, uh, characteristics. So how do they perceive it? What, what did they, uh, were they impacted in the past three years? So, we, um, so what do we see? So we asked uh, these things in terms of liquid scales from very strong decrease to very strong increase. Uh, so the reds are, are bad and the greens are good. Uh, and we see a lot of red. 
especially manufacturing firms, they straw, saw very strong input cost increases due to the impact of the climate, uh, climate transition. And then we tried to be a bit um, creative. Uh, so we asked this question for input costs. We did the same for sales prices. Uh, and then we calculated some difference to, to have some pass-through proxy. So if they have a rise in input costs, can they also rise their sales prices? Um, and that gives you another indicator. Uh, so putting a number on qualitative responses, that's the idea. And then we looked at those firms that have a negative pass-through. So they don't, cannot transfer or pass through their, their rises in input costs. And then you again see you know, what are the groups that suffer from this uh, manufacturing ETS firms. So that's a bit problematic because these are the firms that will have to make additional investments uh, going forward. Uh, demand is a bit neutral, so you see a lot of greens and a lot of reds. And when we look at investments, well, it's ambiguous. You see also greens and reds. Um, but we also see here that investments outside of the EU so we ask for investments in Belgium, in the EU, and outside the EU. Well, investments outside of the EU uh, tend to increase for these ETS firms. So they tend to move out or relocate. And then we dug a little bit deeper because that's a bit worrisome. We looked at those firms that reduced their investments in Belgium. Uh, and we saw what do they do? Do they increase their investments in the EU? Well, no, they don't. They decrease their investments in the EU. But they increase their investments outside of the EU. Uh, and then we zoomed in on those firms. We looked at their characteristics. Because yeah, it was a long survey, so we asked for a lot of stuff. Uh, so we have a lot of data on these, these firms. OK, so this is the past impact. And then we asked them to, to look forward to, to the future. What is the anticipated impact of the climate transition on firm operations? So we asked them to look forward to 2030. Uh, and then the same, yeah, OK, we have rises in input costs, rises in sales prices. And this is on top on what, of what they already expect. Uh, so the, the, the last graph uh, compares the past input costs with uh, the future ones, uh, and same with sales prices. So you see there are similar patterns going on there. Um, yeah, demand, again, a bit symmetric, hard to interpret, um, but it's slightly negative for ETS firms, but maybe this is a difficult one to, to, uh, to gauge. Um, when we looked at investment, when we look at it, well, it's neutral for the average respondent. That's this black thing, so it's slightly negative, but it's okay. But when we look uh, at the different sectors, uh, it's especially bad for agriculture. That's a small group in our sample. But it's also very negative for manufacturing, uh, which is a problem because this is the most productive industry we have. So, yeah, worrisome. Um, and again, we look at these, uh, these firms that plan to increase their investments outside of the EU, or the net investment intent. That's just the difference between the, the firms uh, increasing their investments and those decreasing their investments. And then you hope to, that these things are in balance um, or that it's positive. Um, and you see that, well, especially ETS firms tend to increase their investments outside of the EU. So voila. So this is, was a baseline. Just we wanted to know a lot of things. Um, to describe these companies, where they are, what they, do they expect, and then um, this is where the, the, my first question comes in. So I ask you to think about this uh, EU ETS price, what you expect it to be by 2030. Um, so we ask for their expectations, and we also try to change their expectations. And that's what we do here. Um, so I'm gonna ask for a volunteer, uh, Dennis. Hi. Do you have an expectation for your EU ETS carbon price up until 2030. Yeah. 200 euros, okay. Well, our experiment entailed giving some people information, some people not, uh, which was possible. And then we showed them this, this graph, so a picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, we showed them the planned emission reduction goals on the left, and that's a graph that is in the annual report of the National Bank, which is very interesting to read. Uh, and on the right, we have carbon prices. Um, the past in gray, and then some predictions by Bloomberg up until 2030. So I'm gonna ask you again, Dennis, do you want to change your expectation based on this graph? You'll stick overconfident. Okay. <laughs> so we saw, saw a lot of this. We saw a lot of people sticking to their beliefs. Uh, some people do change. Uh, but that, that's the setup. So we believe that these information experiments, uh, so field experiments, uh, they, and scenario analysis can really simulate the impact of a substantial carbon price increase. 
Uh, so we, can, we really want to find some causal evidence to what would happen if a climate policy would become more stringent and what would happen to firm operations. So three steps, we measure prior expectations, that's what's what we did in previous sections. So what do they expect now without any additional information? And then some treatment um, based on public information. So it's forward looking, it's public, it's very neutral. And then, um, oh, thanks, thanks, uh, 10 minutes, okay. And then we just repeat some questions from the first part to see whether they changed or not. And then we have some bonus round to see what would happen, so what if question, uh, what would happen if this price would be 250 euros and then it was a long survey, so we asked for a lot of stuff. Uh, so what do we see? So um, Dennis doesn't change his expectation. Some people do. So on average, uh, when you look at the treatment group, carbon price is first row. Um, well, people, when we compare the prior and the posterior expectation, people do have an upward provision, both in the median and the mean, uh, while the control doesn't change that much. Uh, and we see the same for gas prices and energy prices, so they don't really distinguish between both, but there is an upward revision for both. Uh, so they do associate stringent climate policy with higher energy prices. And then we compared these uh, prior and posterior expectations, so on the x-axis the prior, y-axis the posterior, and just saw whether there are some patterns uh, that are there. So um, the diagonal line are the denises, they don't change. Um, and then you have this, this uh, horizontal line that's 150 euros that was hidden in our, in our graph. So it goes up until 150. Um, and the same for the vertical line. Uh, so people which are, who are below this line, they, they have something lower uh, than 150 euros. Um, and, a, and the same if you're left from this line. Your posterior is also below 150 euros. So then this would be about yeah, this red, the red dot. That's the idea. And we saw a lot of different uh, responses, and this might indicate that people either are overconfident or they have an accurate estimate, or there can be many reasons, but we do see that there are diverse responses, so heterogeneous effects. Um, and also within this ETS group, which are assumed to have some more um, knowledge or background about ETS prices or tend to follow these predictions. Um, so a lot going on. Um, and then we looked at these, these differences and we interpreted them as carbon price shocks. So it's uh, exogenous variation uh, that, we, that we introduced because it's an experiment. Um, and we compared them to the, the scenario shocks. So uh, these are differences in expectations. So if it's a zero euro, well, your prior is equal to your posterior, like you, Dennis. Um, and uh, the gray lines are the scenario. So we asked whether, uh, what, what they would do if the price was 250 euros. So what do we see? A lot of people tend to say zero. They disregard the information. Um, but there are some, I think about 30% in the experiment had an upward revision. And of course, in the scenario, it's a what if question. Um, they, they do tend to have higher shocks. So uh, there's a difference of 100 euros, so they don't think or they don't consider 250 euros uh, as very plausible in their strategic planning. I think you can conclude that. Okay. Um, so let's look at the, the scenario that's a bit cleaner. Uh, we did the same with the information experiment and then we just saw whether it confirms our results. Uh, if we look at that, we see that um, we just looked at the people who had a non-zero carbon price shock and we looked at input costs, sales prices, demand and investments. And again, all the bad patterns are there. So we have a rise in input costs, a rise in sales prices, a decrease in demand, a decrease in investments in Belgium and a decrease in investments in the EU. Whereas investments out to the EU is, is a bit symmetric, so that's a bit difficult to interpret. Um, so not great. So we uh, tried to confirm that result with regressions, where we uh, made uh, dummy groups for the carbon price shocks. So if you have a positive dummy, well, you have a positive carbon price shock, same with zero and negative. You see that this group who have an upward revision in carbon price expectations, they tend to have well, all the bad things, rising input costs, rising sales prices, and so on. Uh, and we try to control for um, the, the size of the shock. So if you have a higher shock, do you move farther on the liquor scale? Uh, well, it's not statistically significant, so it's hard to interpret. And we also looked at priors. So if you have a high prior in input cost, you have limited room to wiggle. Uh, so if you're already at high increase, yeah, okay, you, you don't have uh, much space to the right. Um, so we had all these characteristics uh, about these firms, uh, what, are their, what the sector is, what their prior expectations were, what the past expectations were, and then we tried to look for patterns. And we do find some, some different 
different stuff, which might be interesting or expected. Uh, so for example, if we look at construction, well, on top of the baseline regression, they find an increase in input costs, whereas manufacturing, they have an increase in sales prices, decrease in investments in the EU, and a rise in investments outside of the EU. So that's not great. Uh, and then we tried to confirm those results using the experiment where we had a more implicit shock, uh, and that's more or less in the same line, um, which, is, which is great. How much time do I still have in my memory? Okay, okay. right on time then. Uh, so what did we learn from this survey? So we provide a, a snapshot of how firms are preparing for the 2030 milestone, a couple of years before it. Um, and firms perceive the climate transition to be a, a classical uh, negative supply shock. And we also found that this portion of production capacity might move outside of the EU, especially manufacturing, uh, very problematic, not great. Um, and then we had this, this causal evidence, uh, this experiment that carbon price increases could exacerbate these effects. Um, so, and these things are planned so they're, they're expected or they're in the public domain, uh, so not great. Uh, whereas everyone thinks that everything is strategically important, uh, they're very unfamiliar with what is happening, uh, what carbon prices are, what, what the goals are, or they don't believe in them. Um, and again, usual suspects for the key, key barriers, high costs, reduced profitability, uh, unclear policy guidance, and administrative burdens. So um, this all fits in with the competitiveness of, of the EU going forward. Um, and I would like to conclude with, don't be like these people in this cartoon. Don't try to wait for something magical to happen. Um, you have to be a bit proactive. So I'm going to end on that, that message. I think that's a good way to end. Thank you. <laughs>